Hello, good afternoon, or good morning if you're on the West Coast. Uh, it's not quite afternoon yet, but thanks for joining us on our checkerboard chat. Um, I am Dr. Kelly Vineyard, and I'm one of the equine nutritionists on the Purina Horse Feed team. And uh, I'm happy to be back here with you. And I've also, I'm also happy to have Dr. Karen Davison, another one of our equine nutritionists here with me today. Hey, Karen, thanks for hey. jumping on today. So this is going to be a, a fun conversation today because we're going to work really hard uh, to talk about some myths and myth, misconceptions in feeding horses. We're going to do our best to debunk some of these myths, right, Karen? You um, bet. And, and thank you guys for sending in some of uh, some myths. We got some really good uh, things to talk about today, you know, but um I thought it might be good to start out our conversation a little bit about, you know, let's think about where myths come from, right? Um, most of us that are feeding horses um, have been doing it for a long time and we have heard lots of advice, right? And we like to give advice too sometimes. And sometimes uh, advice uh, can be good and sometimes it uh, can be not so good. And so I just wanted to like talk a little bit about where some of these myths might come from, where some advice might come from and, and encourage you to think about, you know, considering the source when you, um, when you take advice and, and questioning whether or not could this be a myth? Could, could this be something that's been passed down, you know, without a lot of scientific uh, backing to it? So I think my favorite myth and Karen, think about your favorite myth because this is the, the one or the one source of a myth that I hear a lot that I want to just, um, uh, word of mouth. Okay. So word of mouth, uh, about, uh, or antidotal information, there's, it's like a double edged sword. Sometimes antidotal, uh, information is, can actually be very useful, but oftentimes, uh, you don't have enough information to know, uh, whether or not that uh, piece of advice was specific to a certain situation or if it can be applied, you know, across the board. So my favorite, you know, my trainer uh, feeds XYZ supplement because it calms horses. Um, okay, that would be kind of an antidotal uh, example of my trainer said to feed this or uh, I read this in an internet chat room. Somebody's uh, had really good uh, experience with this certain feeding regimen, and I'm going to try it. Um, that's a, an example of word of mouth. Uh, what's another example, Karen, uh, of where myths well, come from? It kind of along those lines, but it, it's kind of like, well, I, that's just what I've always done, or that's what my dad or my granddad did. And, yeah. you know, I always think when people come up with that, like, well, that's what my dad always did, or what my dad granddad did. I always think about that the very first time I ever saw a horse transported, was in my grandfather's pickup truck when they backed up to a high spot in the ground and jumped the horse up in the back of the truck. That's how they hauled horses around. So if I did things the way my grandfather did, that's how I would show up at the rodeo. <laughs> you know, it's just riding around. You might be pulled over the by the cops if you yeah. did that now. Uh, it depends on what state you're in. <laughs> <I guess> so. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but the idea that, you know, if it worked for dad or granddad, it's good enough for me. And, and there's always things in there that have some merit, but the idea of that we've also got advances in knowledge and hopefully we've, we've learned and, and, and things change over time. And it's kind of an interesting balance because there are what we call myths or old wives tales or, or those kind of things that sometimes they circle back around and you find some scientific proof mm -hmm. that, Hey, that actually had some basis. I think the thing that scares me the most in today's world is, is something you alluded to is like, where do you get your information? And it used to be, we would get it from word of mouth. Like I'd be at a horse show. You'd be at a horse show. I'd look at your horse and go, wow, oh, your horse looks pretty good. What do you do? And you might tell me, but when we're on the internet in a chat room and your people have a lot of opinions, you can't even see their horses to know, like, would you really want to do what they do? Right. And then I know you and I have the experience that as nutritionists, there's times we go look at some of that recommendation and we kind of run the numbers and crunch it a little bit and go, oh my goodness, that's so misguided. That's so scary that people are going to follow that advice because whatever was just, you know, whatever that advice is, it might make your horse fat and shiny, but they're going to have an inverted calcium and phosphorus ratio. And if you do that over time, that could cause some problems. So just that idea of that kind of unvetted or unchecked, mm -hmm. um, you know, just following somebody's opinion when you really don't know if they know any more than you do. 
<laughs> so where what so if someone were to to come across a piece of advice on the internet um, or from word of mouth, how could they go about confirming that that that's actually uh, something that would be recommended? I mean, for me, number one, you can always ask your veterinarian right about feeding your horse. Um, that's a really good place to start, and most people have a horse vet. Um, I would also say you can always ask uh, someone like a, a, a nutritionist or someone who works for a feed company that has education in, in nutrition. Um, and then also go to, you know, your local university. Uh, the extension agents are a really good source of information, either, you know, in person or, or on their website. Um, are there some other good information sources that people can that you can think of, Karen, that people can refer to? Well, I, for me, obviously, I have the most faith in in, in us. So I would say <laughs> you can always email. Uh, you go to the Purina dot PurinaMills.com, go to the website and email or call our 800 number. It's on every package or every piece of material that we have out there is, is to call our 800 number. Um, and, you know, expect that you would get honest advice and, and information that was science based. And it, it wouldn't, you know, it's not like we're going to try to sell them a Purina product if it doesn't fit. So, um, just find a good, reliable source. I, I, there's yeah. a, there's a lot of them out there. I would just say, do your due diligence and maybe, you know, it's kind of, kind of like sometimes going to the doctor, get that second opinion <laughs> before yeah. you change your horse's whole diet. Take that extra step before diving in. So, okay, well let's, let's dive in and kind of maybe set the record straight on some of these popular myths. I'm checking out over here in the chat. We've got a lot of people, um, tuning in from all over the country, uh, New Jersey, Michigan, Ohio, North Carolina. It's great to see you guys. Um, so earlier we had um, solicited some some myths. And I think one of the top requests we got, Karen, was, was this myth, which is too much protein or too much alfalfa will make your horse hot. I, I, I bought into this myth at one point and my uh, horse riding career uh, <laughs> before I went to school and, and kind of learned a little bit more about where this came from. So, so yeah, let's break this down a bit. I mean, this poor guy uh, is coming off his horse. I don't think it's because he fed his horse too much alfalfa though. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know that you could put a lot of different, I, we get a lot of different questions. I mean, you could take out protein and alfalfa. I think we also had one on beet pulp and right. there's always, there's, there's lots of Corn, different things. Make sure horse it's that crazy. whole idea yeah. of, um, and I'm assuming that by hot here, we we're meaning reactive, you know, hy hyperactive, you know, hard to ride like that. Um, cause sometimes hot could mean overheated. And there was some information years ago, and it, I don't know if any of you remember summer's a good time to call back this memory, but when they had the summer Olympics in Atlanta in like 1996, I know some of y'all weren't even alive. Hey, but I actually went. <laughs> you I, went. I, yeah, I did. I was yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. And, and so there was this conversation that started there about too much protein, making horses hot or being hard on athletes. And it came from, you know, those horses working in the heat and humidity. And the thing is, it's kind of that word of mouth thing. It got translated and you have a, you know, a, a, an Olympic level three day event horse who somebody's, you know, said, if you feed them high percent protein in their feed, that they're going to overheat, they're going to have trouble staying hydrated, all those things. And that may have been true for that level of horse. But when you translate, you know, that horse was eating maybe eight pounds of feed a day, 10 pounds of feed a day. And at 10% protein at 10 pounds of feed, he gets a pound of protein a day. But if you translate that back and you go, I have my weekend horse that I trail ride once a month and, but I'm going to only feed that much percent protein, you end up with much less protein intake. So there is a little bit of truth in that myth in that in a high end performance horse, if you feed an over, I mean, over a, a significantly protein. over abundance right. of of protein, they do excrete a lot of water trying to clear out that wasted mm -hmm. protein, especially when it's coming from the hay, like alfalfa, because everybody who's ever cleaned a stall in a horse that's eating straight alfalfa hay, you know where a lot of that protein goes, right? Oh, you it can smell it. Yeah. Oh yeah, it ends up, <laughs> they excrete it in the urine and um, they have to drink a lot of water to do that. So there is that end of it, 
But for most of us, a normal, healthy horse, um, I've, I have fed straight alfalfa in my life. I've fed straight grass hay. I've fed a combination of the two. And what generally happens is not the protein in alfalfa that might make a horse, quote, hot or hyperactive. It's just that 20 pounds of alfalfa has more calories in it right. than 20 pounds of a Bermuda grass hay or an orchard grass hay. So if you fed the same amount, you give them more calories. Some horses will just get fat which would be more insulation, which might make them hotter and, you know, if they're, if they're overweight <laughs> right. in the heat and humidity. But from a reactive standpoint, it's just more about the calories than it would be the protein. Yeah, it's, uh, and that is definitely uh, my experience when talking with horse owners is their concern about high protein alfalfa making a horse overreactive or unrideable or, you know, people like to say crazy. I don't like to call horses crazy. It's not always the horse that's crazy. Um, but you know, and it is the energy. And one of the other things that um, I think this myth may have originated from is maybe 20, maybe even 30 years ago, um, when, when commercial feeds were just coming out and a lot of people were focused on the percent protein and you would buy your feed based on a 10%, 12%, 14%. And back then, typically the higher the protein level in your commercial feed, the more high quality and the more calories that feed would have as well. So um, it would go along. Higher protein went with higher calories and maybe there were was a reaction in the horse, but it was based on the higher calories they were getting, not necessarily the protein. Nowadays, we have high fat feeds. We can have very high calorie feeds with, you know, 10 or 12% crude protein. And you might have a 14% feed with, with lower calories and your horse isn't going to get as much energy from some of those higher protein feeds. So yeah. it, it, I think for me, the bottom line on this myth, it's the calories, not the protein, which may affect horse, you know, temperament and management. Well, and I would just add that the, the relationship between nutrition and behavior <laughs> is a very inexact science. Very and so. there are a lot of reasons horses can be reactive. It could be a bad fitting saddle. It could be a bit that's pinching, you know, pinching their mouth. It could be a number of things, uh, you know, just need a little training, need a little, need a little discipline, those kind of things or whatever. So there are some things nutritionally that we found over time that can help kind of modulate or blunt that reactivity, like, you know, higher fat diets may in some horses make them less reactive compared to a horse eating that same amount of calories as corn and oats. Um, but that's, again, not, you, you're not going to make a thoroughbred racehorse a kid's pony by changing their, their diet like that. Right. Uh, uh, unfortunately not. It's not going to happen. All right. Let's see if we have any Anybody else have any comments about the, the high protein myth? I mean, I, I really do think you can insert, like you said, other, you hear this beet pulp, for example, or other ingredients. And, and, and it all, I don't know that there's any evidence that a certain ingredient has a, such a strong line between behavior and, and that ingredient. It's kind of what you were saying. So that's, yeah, for sure. Overfeeding for the level of activity would probably be one of the bigger contributors That's to any right. of that. Regardless of the ingredients in that. They say wet saddle blankets cure a lot of behavior issues is what I've always been told. That's right. So, okay. Myth number two. Um, let's talk about, this is a good one. Um, horses should be fed like mother nature intended. So, Mother Nature, you know, that is a, a lofty goal, right? It's, it's healthy. It's good. That's, um, you know, horses were evolved to, to eat grass. So why is this a myth, Karen? Why is it a myth that that's how we should always feed horses only? Well, well, I like to ask people sometimes when, when that, I, boy, if I had a dollar for every time I'd been told that or, or asked that question, I, I would have more dollars. Um, but my comment back to people sometimes is that mother nature is really good at supporting horses of a certain type and that, you know, I guess I, I would ask sometimes how many people have 25,000 acres of free range pasture for their horse and how many have a horse that they're fine if it matures at around six or seven years of age and weighs about eight or 900 pounds and, you know, maybe lives into its early teens and 
you know, that's kind of what mother, mother nature supports. And as long as that horse is out in mother nature and, you know, all they have to do is walk around and try to find enough to eat today to make it to another day and maybe outrun the fastest thing trying to eat them on any given day. Um, mother nature's pretty good at that, but I, I, mother nature's not very good at supporting, you know, an 18 hand <laughs> draft horse or a, you know, uh, NFR barrel horse or whatever, you know? So once we take those horses out of mother nature and the environment changes and the demands we place on them change, I think we just have to help support those higher demands in those different environments and, and mother nature, you know, the idea that I can get it done in, in my little small pasture or my bale of hay. And that, that means mother nature. That's not the whole right. picture. And, and, and I think that's all really, really good points because we are not managing horses the way that mother nature would be managing them um, mo in most cases. Um, but there, I think there is a little bit of truth in this myth and, and maybe the truth would be that horses, we, we do want to take into consideration how horses were designed to, to eat and how their digestive system is designed, but we can still play to that um, you know, not relying on them grazing on a pasture 24 seven on 25,000 acres, but we can, you know, give them, you know, feeds that match the way they're designed to digest them. I mean, that's not what we're saying is a myth. What we're saying is throwing your, you know, upper level dressage horse out on a pasture and not supplement, supplementing him with any minerals or any extra protein or, you know, not doing all the things that we do to get our horses in tip top competition shape, you're not going to be successful to do that. And your horse is going to suffer uh, if you expect that to be the ideal way to manage them. Um, yeah. I used know. to say it's kind of outdated now, but I remember when Michael Phelps was doing all his, you know, eight, nine gold medals, whatever it is he did. The big thing being the nutrition nerd that I am, the thing that struck me was the he ate 12,000 calories a day. Right. And I was like, oh my God, how much fun would that be <laughs> to be able to eat 12,000 calories a day for a couple of days? But the point for me was, again, as a nutrition nerd, I look at that and go, what if, like, what am I supposed to eat a day? A couple thousand calories a day. Not what do I eat? What am I supposed to eat a mm -hmm. day? But what if Michael Phelps ate like me? Would he win all those gold medals? Could he have gone back to back races day after day? Absolutely not. Right. Now, if I ate like Michael Phelps, would I be able to win eight gold? No, I would not. And I would be huge. So it's, it's about feeding your horse to achieve the demands placed on them. And, right. and I think that's sometimes where we get, get mistaken is, is that our horses, we're asking them to do different things. And so we, you know, if, if they're a pasture ornament, we have ways to feed them like they're a pasture ornament. If they're a high performance horse, there's different ways to feed them to support high performance. Right. Well, I think that's a bit of a good segue into another one of the myths that was brought up. Um, and uh, when we were kind of uh, asking our, um, our fans to tell us some myths, I think Kristen wanted to know about all horses need a low NSC diet. Now, if you think about, you know, talking about mother nature, typically forages, um, can be considered low non-structural carbohydrate in some, in some cases, but that's not all mother nature, uh, provides for horses too. You know, there are grains that, that we know that wild horses would eat with, that would be getting some non-structural carbohydrate, uh, content there. We know some, some forages, you know, depending on their, um, variety, they can be fairly high too. Cool season forages would be a good example of that. So all horses need a low non-structural carbohydrate diet. For me, you kind of have to break this down. Um, number one, anytime you make a blanket statement, usually blanket statements aren't going to hold true for the most part. Um, I would say some horses uh, need a low non-structural carbohydrate diet. And those are the horses that have a diagnosed medical condition. That would be like insulin resistance or insulin dysregulation. Um, you know, perhaps you're managing a horse with PSSM type one. Um, there are certain conditions that we know uh, from the, the horses do better with a low non-structural carbohydrate diet. But what about a racehorse, Karen? What about a horse that's in training? Uh, you know, we got the two-year-old training sale going on in, in Florida and in, in Ocala. They're all trying to go win the Derby, you know, at some point in their career. They want to 
be successful on the track? What about those horses? Do they need a low NSC diet? You know, they will struggle with a low NSC diet because the starches and the sugars are what fill the muscle glycogen stores. And that's the fuel that uh, muscle burns to do fast work. And you can't get that with fiber and fat. They won't fill that fuel tank in those muscles fast enough for a horse like a race horse or a horse that's doing any high intensity work repetitively. Um, so again, that's more of that feed the horse to what they're doing um, that, and not have that, that blanket statement across the board. In fact, you know, years ago, because of the way human athletes work and there's a whole thing in human athlete athletes where they do glycogen super compensation, it's where if, you know, especially marathon runners or high end athletes, they would try to manipulate their muscles through their diet and their exercise to, really deplete that muscle glycogen and then eat a bunch of starch and carbs and try to fill that overfill that tank so that they have more of that muscle energy stored so that they don't run out of gas at the end of the race and they don't run out of fuel in that fuel tank, so to speak. We found that didn't work very well in horses because they just, yeah. their muscles you can't don't carb load a horse. Well, yeah. and they don't do very well because when you take anything to an extreme, so even like this low NSC diet, I have gotten calls from people when they have found very extreme ways to go very low NSC. And sometimes it's well-intentioned to your point. They may have a horse with metabolic syndrome, whatever. They're, the, the goal is good, but they carried it too far. And we know that there's certain tissues like brain tissue and hoof tissues that preferentially need glucose yes. to, uh, to be at their optimum. And so you'll end up, if you're not careful, with this horse who stands over in the corner and the hooves don't grow very fast and he's kind of lethargic and depressed because that's what we saw in the horses when we tried to actually decrease their carbs enough to get them to burn all their glycogen out to try to super compensate them. These horses got depressed. They got mad. They didn't want to work <laughs> because <laughs> their, their brain was a little bit, you know, it was missing out on some energy. So I think it's like anything when you talk about nutrition, it's find that range that's good and, and for that animal and low is kind of an arbitrary term. Right. Cause that's what is low where people, I think, I feel like they don't understand what the term low means. And, Part of it is because we don't, uh, from the scientific community ex or horse nutrition community, nobody can really agree on what the definition of low is. But, you know, for me, uh, a low carbohydrate diet, you know, if you're looking at the whole, are you looking at the whole diet or are you looking at the concentrate? That's the first question to ask because it might be different when you're talking about the whole diet versus a, a concentrate because you may feed different amounts of that concentrate. Um, but horses can and do digest carbohydrates really efficiently, um, but there is a threshold and, and you know, you don't want to go Absolutely. above that threshold, obviously. So if, you know, we don't want to feed 25 pounds of corn in one feeding, that's way high and, and, and obviously, but they can, they handle a little bit. Sure they can. And, 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 and it depends on where that carbohydrate, uh, you know, how much you're feeding and, and how much is in what you're feeding but it, it actually is one of those things that um, low is, is relative. I don't know. What Do we have a number for what low should be? I always think about in the forage, you know, we kind of target that 12% uh, sugar plus starch. When we're trying to feed a horse with metabolic condition conditions, I'm targeting a 12% or below for this horse with insulin resistance. But if you have a horse that doesn't have a metabolic condition, fe feeding more than that is safe for those horses. Yeah. And I always get a little, it's the same kind of conversation we were having around protein a little bit. I get worried when you focus on a percent right. and you don't account for how much you eat in a meal. And I, I think we have a graphic. It's about protein and it's about uh, en enrich a ration balancer, but it still gives that idea of you got to do a little bit of math because I've had people that will say that I'm feeding a, you know, my feed that's 10% starch and sugar is safer than this other feed that's 13% starch and sugar. But when mm -hmm. you account for the amount you feed, it's actually how much starch and sugar is in that meal. So like when you look at this graphic, this is, again, it's on protein, but it could be on anything else. It's just doing the math. So in a ration balancer, like in Rich Plus, 
it's one pound feeding rate meets all their protein, vitamins, and minerals uh, that are missing in an all forage diet. So back to that mother nature, mother nature with a little support, they absolutely need some additional protein, vitamins, and minerals on an all forage diet. But a lot of people look at the percent protein on that bag and get concerned and go, oh my gosh, I can't feed 32% protein to my horse. And if you look at the graphic, you can see that if you feed one pound of it, that gives you 145 grams of protein. And, and how do you get that one pound? You convert that to kilograms, which is like 0.45 times 32%, right? And that gives you 145. Yeah, there you go. Or, and that's what we did here for me. I would, yeah. you know, I do one pound times 0.32%. That gives me 0.32 pounds of protein. Whereas three pounds of a 10% give you 0.3 pounds of protein. So you multiply the number of pounds times the percentage and it gives you an amount, whether you calculate it in grams or whether you calculate it yep. in pounds is, is not, it doesn't matter. It's just the fact that I wouldn't feed six pounds of Enrich. There's no reason to do that. But if, it's, if a horse doesn't need six pounds, they still need a certain level of protein, minimum amount of protein. And it takes that higher percentage to get that done. So to walk that back around again to that NSC question, I get, there are some generalities of like, oh, 10 to 12% starch plus sugar feels like the safer range, but you've got to take into account the size of the meal. It's yeah. really, really important. And you know, the research we did when we did well solve low starch, it wasn't just about the percent starch and sugar or even the total amount. It was the amount in that meal. And so we learned that you could feed the same amount of starch and sugar in a four pound meal as you do in a two pound meal. And the insulin response to the four pound meal is greater just because of the volume of the meal. So when you're really taking care of those really sensitive horses, it's important to account for everything, not just hit a certain percent starch and sugar number. Right. So yeah, don't get hung up on percentages. Take it a step further and do the math. Do the math. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, and I think uh, maybe we have, uh, let's move on to another myth. Um, and it, it still kind of falls along the theme, I think, about, um, you know, feeding horses kind of like mother nature or naturally. And and the myth is all horses can get the mineral, all the minerals they need from a mineral block. Now, when, when I say a mineral block, uh, I'm talking about that red salt block that everybody, you know, has out in the pasture or, you know, sometimes there are other colors, but most of the time they're red. And, you know, a lot of us think, well, I'm going to buy the red one because I get a little bonus. I'm getting some minerals in there. When I buy the white salt blocks, that's just salt, right? Well, actually... Um, with these types of blocks that are hard, uh, these red salt blocks are, are salt blocks. That's that. that yeah, I would percentage say percentage of there you go. Of you salt. cut out for just a second. Sorry. I Somebody tried to call me. I'm on my phone and like oh. didn't know that they shouldn't have called me right now. <laughs> so <laughs> go ahead. No, I was just saying that those red salt blocks are a very small percentage of minerals. Uh, and, and here in this graphic, it, it shows that, you know, it takes, if a horse were to need to use, to get his copper requirement met with this trace mineralized salt block, he would need to eat one and a half pounds per day of this block. And, you know, no horse is going to eat a pound and a half of that in a day. Uh, unless, they have, unless they have some kind of stereotypy or something, but um, they, uh, th those are salt blocks too. You know, they're sprinkled in with a little bit of mineral. Yeah. My, my highly technical way of explaining that is if it's as hard as a salt block, it's a salt block. It's a salt block. It's not yeah. a true mineral block and they can't eat enough. And not only it's, it's trace amounts of trace minerals. So that leaves out your macro minerals like ca uh, calcium and phosphorus, which are also necessary for horses. Um, so it, you know, cattle have rougher tongues and they have a different mineral need than horses and they might be helpful in a cattle program, but I still think the cattle nutritionist would tell you, you need a more complete balanced mineral. Um, so yeah, it doesn't matter what color block you get, if it's hard as a salt block. And when you look at the tag, you'll find they're 95 to 98% salt, regardless of what color they are. Um, I think we have a video of a horse eating a, a mineral, like our horse mineral, our free balance horse mineral is actually the opposite. It's 
5% salt and 95% mineral, including the macro minerals. So a horse can eat a, a true mineral block will be softer than a trace mineralized salt block. That's right. And I, I think a lot of people use these salt blocks kind of like an insurance policy because it, it does make them feel like, you know, maybe you have an easy keeper out in the pasture. They keep, you know, good body weight when they're just eating forage alone. But the myth would be that the salt, this red mineral block is providing what they need. So what's a better alternative to the red mineral block is kind of to provide their minerals and extra needs. Yeah. For me, the very minimum for a horse on an all forage or free choice pasture diet would be a, a free balance mineral. That'd be the very minimum. And if you've got good green pasture and your horse isn't doing anything, free balance mineral and an additional salt block, especially those horses that we call uh, marginally managed, the ones you don't want to go out and feed or see every day. Um, the most uh, specific way to do it would be give them a pound a day of Enrich Plus. Oh, and that would be just, yeah. you wouldn't have to worry about whether they ate enough because we do know from our research that horses will on average eat the amount of free choice mineral they should but on a daily basis they don't all eat exactly what they should so yeah. free choice is better than not giving it to them but if you don't mind going out there at least once a day one pound of enrich plus will do a better job plus it right. gives you amino acids yeah and and for me that's always my best recommendation for the for the easy keepers but then you know, good news if you if you are feeding, uh, for example, like a Purina concentrate feed, like a strategy or an Omeline, if you feed to the to the recommended feeding rates on the tags, th their mineral requirements are being met as well uh, exactly. with, with a concentrate feed. So there's, you know, it's not wrong to throw a red salt block out in the pasture. Um, just know what it's there for. It's to provide a little bit extra salt, <laughs> not yeah. necessarily minerals. Um, and, you know, I would even add too, it's, it's, it's hot. I'm in Florida. We're riding horses. They're sweating. Um, it's probably not best to rely on that salt block to provide your horses mineral salt needs at this, especially this time of year. Um, you know, they need about just 10 grams of sodium chloride a day just for maintenance. And then as they sweat, they need more. And, um, that's where top dressing salt or top dressing a commercial electrolyte becomes really important because it's hard for them to lick enough material off that salt block to meet their electrolyte needs too. That's true. I have horses who will use salt blocks and then I have some salt blocks that I think are as old as I am. Oh yeah. They're like <laughs> three layers of uh, dust and dirt on top of them and manure yeah. and um, no, no horse is going to eat that. <laughs> All right. Well, we have, uh, come to the end of our um our myths that, that that we had uh submitted and that we had prepared um i don't know karen do you see any more myths in the comments there i would address i wouldn't mind just taking a couple minutes and answering Lori's question of what do you recommend for feed for a miniature donkey ah, and yes. and just because the donkeys and mini donkeys especially are um well they're just cool little animals to begin mm -hmm. with. I, I want one. That's like my goal in life is to have one. I always hear they're I such good, them. good animals are smart and, and all those things. But one of the things that keeps me a little bit leery of getting one is they're so efficient with calories really and are. You, they are so prone to get overweight and founder and, you know, metabolic and all that fun stuff. So because they did evolve as very efficient little creatures. And so um, they also, there's research that says, don't need as much protein as a horse. Uh, so donkeys and mules and, and miniature donkeys, sometimes, especially if they're not getting any exercise, you've really got to watch their body condition. Mm -hmm. um, make sure they do have a free balance mineral out, or you can feed a, a, the correct amount of Enrich Plus to get their little amount of vitamins and minerals they need, but rarely do they really need feed. So that's one of the things I like about Enrich Plus. I call it nutrition for animals that don't need feed or for horses that don't need feed. And that would include donkeys. But the right. biggest thing with them is to me is, is making sure they get their minerals. And they, if, if you're feeding kind of a marginal quality grass, hay, they do benefit from additional amino acids in, in a little bit of a quality protein, um, but just really keep their body condition in check so that they don't get that overweight going to founder Got yeah, it. you almost always have to utilize some type of forage uh, management, either dry lotting them for part of the day or, um, you know, I know there are some donkey um, experts out there that would say feeding them straw can help too, instead of like a, a just even a grass tech kind of lower quality 
uh, forage because otherwise they're just super efficient uh, creatures. That is for sure. Exercise your donkey. I know. <laughs> so, hey, a little, little cart. That's my dream to have yeah. a cart and have my miniature donkey pull me behind yeah. a cart. One day that's going to happen. Um, so I can't see the comments anymore. So if there's anything oh, else okay. you need to, to address, uh, you're going to have to let me know. Otherwise, I think, um, uh, you know, you guys, if you're listening and you come up, uh, especially on the replay and you have another myth that you think of and you want us to bust it, uh, go ahead and put it in the comments and, and we'll try to address it uh, as we as we get them. Um, I just want to remind you, too, that we are here to answer your questions, you know, there's Karen, there's myself. Uh, we have uh, actually a team of six PhDs on the horse team. We also have a really strong team of, uh, you know, Purina sales people. Um, some of you may know them. They're connected with your Purina dealers. If you don't know who they are, um, they're a really good source of information too. Um, they may even come out and, and help you do a, a nutrition consult on your farm. And, and that can be really helpful, especially when you're struggling with, with different issues and maybe want some, some myths busted that, uh, that you've always um, thought that might be true, but maybe you're not getting the results that you, you like and you want to try something, something new. Um, so thanks for, for tuning in. Uh, tell us other topics you would like to hear about in the future checkerboard chats, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining, Karen. Thank you. It's All been right, fun. Thanks.